to develop our skills in endoscopic sinus surgery. Of course, uh, you will have seen many lectures on uh, this sort of uh, presentations like, you know, uh, doing cadaver dissections, you know, doing uh, uh, live cadaver or you go and participate in a cadaver. You will have seen many of such things. But here, I'm going to give you a training during this corona period where you don't need a cadaver, but you can develop your dexterity. So this is going to be something which is, at least to me, the first time in the world uh, that uh, somebody is going to give a training like this. So that is why uh, um, I thought, let me, let me, uh, so what do we do during our Corona period? That is uh, when we, uh, we are shut down at home, there's nothing to, uh, so we are going on listening to lectures. But listening to lectures are not going to take you anywhere because uh, the person who is doing will always keep doing and you will be, uh, your hands will get sort of, you know, rusted. So I always believe that you should do something to improve your skills during this period of complete shutdown. Maybe the shutdown is going to extend till you know May or uh, maybe sometime more. But what happens to your surgical skill? The surgical skill slowly starts deteriorating. This is something which I want to warn every young uh, who has uh, not really started swimming or maybe not learned swimming as yet. That is doing surgeries as yet. So I'm going to, uh, here in this uh, Zoom lecture, uh, going to definitely put into your mind how to do uh, a dissection using endoscopic uh, cameras. And this is what, what is going to be the main topic. Now, uh, I thank uh, Alambic. I, I thank Alambic for uh, the opportunity given to me. Um, I also thank... Uh, my uh, fellows, uh, Dr. Sri Harsha, of course, uh, Dr. Chaitra is here with me, and uh, also uh, my sisters will come during this uh, shutdown period to the hospital to this uh, um, do this uh, lecture demonstration. Well, um, yeah, I want to just tell you that if you have any questions, what you have to do is to put it onto the chat, and uh, you know, Sri Harsha will put that question to me, and I'll ans answer the question. So this is going to be a series of lectures. Every lecture will be preceded by a little uh, demonstration. So this is going to be different in that sense that it's just not going to be a lecture. It's going to be both demonstration as well as a lecture. But you might ask me, without a patient, how will you demonstrate? And that is what we're going to do today. Okay. Now, uh, shall we start, uh, Dr. Sir, Hashra? Sir, uh, just to announce, we have 500 participants to begin with. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's all because of you. You've done a lot of uh, homework, uh, giving a lot of uh, good publicity. And of course, there are so many people at home, so there's nothing much to do. And you will definitely get a very, very nice, uh, 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 you know, uh, steep learning in this uh, particular lecture. I'm very sure about that. Well, uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to be uh, starting with, okay, endoscopic sinus surgery. So endoscopic sinus surgery, I have been traveling, you know, throughout the world, seeing a lot of endoscopic uh, sinus surgeons, and I've seen a lot of top guys who have written great papers. But when you look at the skills, uh, I find that the skills are not very uh, up to the mark. Even though the papers are good, the books are good, but the skills are not up to the mark. But how do you develop your skills to us in India and also to those who really want to become surgeons and not to write just papers? So writing a paper doesn't involve skill. So you really want to become a surgeon who has got good dexterity, then I think you will have to do a lot of homework. So how do you do a lot of homework and get your hands trained? In endoscopic sinus surgery, it is not like any other surgery. This is the only difference between endoscopic uh, sinus or skull base surgery and a head and neck surgery or a ear surgery. What is the difference? In a ear surgery, you're looking through a binocular vision and you have the depth perception and you can operate with both the hands. It's a, it's a beautiful combination of both the hands. Whereas in endoscopic sinus surgery, the problem is you're seeing the monitor, which is, uh, which is away from the field of your uh, uh, surgery, and you're operating with your hand uh, uh, in a different place. So this is uh, something which is totally different from the actual microscopic perception. This is why there is a very steep learning curve in endoscopic sinus surgery. This is uh, what I'm trying to tell you. And how do we improve our dexterity? How do we improve our dexterity? Of course, in uh, microscopic surgery also you can do this, but I will tell you how to do it through an endoscope. So uh, we're going to start this lecture with a demonstration now. 
uh, my dear uh, harsha you going to change it to the endoscopic uh, picture yes sir yes yeah you will be changing it to the endoscopic picture now and i'm going to demonstrate how to uh, so i'm now going to start with my endoscope okay right are we ready so you know how to hold an endoscope right you have to hold it like a flute of course there are people who hold it like this uh, i don't believe in holding the camera it's better to always hold the endoscope like a flute so this is the way where the thumb is acting like the fulcrum here you can see that thumb is acting like the fulcrum and it's like a flute that you're holding the endoscope so this is how you're going to hold it and what we're going to do now is uh, can we switch on to the endoscopic view please okay right uh, you need that you need that it's just two hundred first yeah okay right okay now you can see here that i'm i'm having something like this a model like this uh, there are very simple model you can make in your house you can just make a small uh, roll of paper so you can make a roll of paper uh, uh, or a card which is actually very uh, you know and then you can paste that so this is what is called a jr sinus model and what we are going to do now what you have to do is sitting at home i'm sure everybody has got an endoscope uh, with you at home and everybody has got a camera with you and so what you have to do is make two holes that is one hole in the inferior or superior and you can make that end of that uh, hole which is totally empty and with this i will tell you some exercises which you can follow this is called the jr sinus model and you see how this model is made it's like it's standing like this of course like the patient you can just introduce that endoscope slowly without touching the borders of the uh, of the paper so this is the first exercise i strongly recommend just one two three four do like that so at least 50 times every day try to do this this is very very important and you can see that there are some holes here there are some letters here take a small ball probe so all these you can definitely get in your uh, home itself and you try to introduce that slowly inside and try to draw this eye that is do a zero degree telescope try to draw this eye i like this make this eye like this you see here and then you draw this n like this so this is one way of improving your dexterity in fact when you are sitting at home you can do this very easily you don't need any uh, cadaver so uh, in our center what we do is we do at least one hour of this every day we make the we make the people do it one hour every day and then what you can do the third exercise use a curved instrument like this and without touching the walls go and try to introduce this instrument so this is something like the maxillary sinus so this actually improves the dexterity completely see here without touching it go inside and uh, so you can keep trying to do this this is a very very easy and uh, very cheap exercise so you can do that but it improves the dexterity so this is one way where during the lockdown period you can actually try to increase or maintain your skills in endoscopic sinus surgery and if you do this believe me in one month time i am sure that it will increase your skills and dexterity in endoscopic uh, sinus surgery of course uh, i i do not know how many of you have got this this kind of model you can use this model and you see how how i am doing the uh, uh, surgery in this model you can see it mimics the uh, middle turbinate the inferior turbinate there i am now trying that's a superior turbinate this is actually a, a model which is uh, given by carl stores so you can actually use this and you can use the instruments also you can use the instrument i'm going to use my black slick can you give me the black slick now uh, you see here i am trying to uh, use my black slick there's a septal deviation here you can see the spur there acute spur there of course you can definitely use this instrument and try to get your feel by slightly holding the middle turbinate or maybe this model is slightly expensive of course uh, many people may not have this model at home but i am going to give you a uh, definitely a better version a cheaper version for this uh, how how are you going to maintain your skills without you know, just listening to all the lectures so now i am going to show you how to do a four handed four handed technique and we put it on the floor so four handed technique on a egg you see here that's an egg model This is a normal egg holder. So that's a normal egg holder. All of you have got it in your house. What you do is you wrap it around with a X-ray sheet. So this is an X-ray sheet, 
And I made a go that side. So I I just made a small hole like a keyhole here. Okay. And now what you're going to do is you're going to have this egg. All of you will definitely get eggs uh, at home. There is no doubt you will get an egg. And what you're going to do is to make somebody like your mother or your uh, sister hold that endoscope. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to now start doing the four-handed technique. Now you can see here that I'm going to start drilling this egg. You see here, this is very, very important. Now I'm just going to mimic a pituitary surgery. And you can see here, All of you can see it. No, see, Harsha. Yes, sir. We can appreciate, sir. So that's a cella. Imagine that's a pituitary fossa, and I'm now trying to get that pituitary fossa out. So that's actually without any cost. So you're doing this at home. You just have to have a mastoid drill, and of course, you don't even need a suction here. But try to gently try to go closer. Friend, be very careful. Ask your uh, uh, friend or anybody or maybe your family member to hold the endoscope like this. Or you can hold it with your left hand. But it's better to ask somebody to hold the endoscope because that's always better to improve your dexterity in skull based surgery. Now what you do now is once you do that, you can see that membrane, right? You can, can you see that? See your sharp? Yes, sir. You can see, sir. Now, what you have to do is not to breach that membrane. It's very important that you should not breach that membrane. You see what I'm trying to do now. This is something which everybody can do at home, believe me. And what you can do is you can actually do that during this. Water. Okay, now let us do this. Now you see here, what has happened now is I have made a, a cellar hole there. This I call as the egg training. Egg training is really, really good, my dear friends. I'm telling you to increase your dexterity during this period instead of going on listening to lectures. Believe me, this is another. So you just fix the day. So I do this once a week at least so that I don't miss out on my surgical skills. Now what I'm going to do now. Box of the box of the box of the box of Okay, now what I'm going to do is that the planer. So don't try to disrupt the membrane. That's very important. Don't try to disrupt the membrane. If you disrupt the membrane, believe me then you're not a good endoscopic surgeon. So do the carotid. Imagine that the carotid. And now that the carotid canal. The Chaitra is giving me a beautiful view. Thank you, Chaitra. So all of you will be having endoscopes at home. See that? That's a small. If you don't irrigate, then you will have a little problem. You need an irrigation for the crop. But that irrigation is disturbing you. So, try to, now what happened is that I made two bulb holes, and now I'm going to take my elevator. So, uh, elevator, Rosen's elevator. Okay, now you see here what I'm trying to do. 
is that now I'm going to try to remove this small piece of bone. This is what I call as the egg training. So see here, without any any patient, without any uh, um, you know any resource, you can do this. There are three three ways in which you can do it. One is you can boil the egg. So to do a boiled egg is slightly easier than doing it in a fresh egg. Ah, okay, 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 no problem. Don't worry. Okay, I think that was uh, free, that's why it came out. Now having done that, now what I'm going to do is to try to slowly elevate that small bone. See what I'm trying to do now. I'll try to elevate without any shake of your hand. Try to do that in a very, very gentle okay. Membrane is getting attached. Slightly difficult in a fresh egg. See that now. What has happened now is that's the dura. Can you all see the dura now? Okay, now what I will do is I'll take a scissors. Now it's just going to be like the pituitary surgery. So I made a hole now. I'm going to take a straight scissors, which is here. And you can use a scissors, you can use anything in your house. And this is important. The dexterity with which you're going to do this is the most important thing. Yeah, ready. Now I'm going to use my scissors now. Be careful, don't shake it. So that's the dual incision here. So imagine this will actually not cost you anything, but instead of you know wasting your time, this is something which you can definitely do at home. There is so you can easily do this because it doesn't cost you much. So you're trying to now incise the dura. There's actually the, the same consistency as the arachnoid, not the dura, but the arachnoid. I'm going to try to take that out now. I don't know if how many people have done this before or how many have tried it. So if you have not tried, I have not seen anybody doing this in any conference. So I thought, I was thinking about it for the past around, you know, since the shutdown, I did around three eggs. So this is what I wanted to show you as the egg training. So once you've done that dural incision, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the endoscope inside. You see here. So I'm going to introduce the endoscope inside now. You can see that that's actually the uh, uh, the membrane inside. You can see here that that's the yellow, and uh, that's the white of the egg. And now I have to suck that without yeah. Give me a give me a uh, uh, elevator. So I'm going to make it very very smooth. Uh, so you can do a lot of exercise now. So many from here you can go. I'm going to show you how to go from here because many, many, many surgeries are almost the same. This is actually the carotid canal. So this dramatically increases your dexterity. So you can have any sort of camera, vertex camera, anything. You just carry it in your uh, any any camera, any Chinese, whatever, whatever you want, you can take. So it's not that you should have a high-end camera. It's not uh, so that that's actually uh, uh, the arachnoid. I'm trying to take a flap of the arachnoid now, and that is actually the same like what you're doing for the pituitary surgery. I'm trying to, you can put a little, so, take it off. Yeah, yeah, good. 
So what you can do is actually you can suture this with nine zero. You can try to suture it with the, under the microscope. Of course, if you want to do that, you can do that. Now I'm just taking it off. Now I'm going inside to see here, and now you can see that that's actually the membrane here, and I can make the incision now. That that's actually the superior hypoglossal artery, and now I'm trying to make that incision. You see that how that is being made. So the dissection of the cranial pharyngioma. You can see that that's that's a small membrane, maybe a little additions. So why I'm telling this is because many people actually could say that oh I didn't get chances during my PG. You don't have to get. Believe me, you can just do all this to improve your dexterity. And this just give me a suction now. Give me a very so this imagine that this is going to be near the cranial nerve. This is going to be near the cranial nerve, and you see what I'm trying to do is hey, hold the suction very slow. Yeah. See that now? I'm now trying to suck that white. So that's a CSF. That's a CSF now. I'm going towards the cavernous sinus. That is CSF. Have a very very small suction in your house, and that's it. Don't try to disturb the. Mammillary bodies. The LO is the mammillary bodies and the hypothalamus. So have the suction which is very low. Okay, now give me a scissors. Now you can see here that now I have created a arachnoid membrane over the uh, yeah suction piece. Have both the hands, and then Chaitra is going to show me what I'm going to do inside now. This is going to be the real, real challenge. Now see how she is showing me and how I'm going to dissect this membrane. So that's it. So I opened it. You can see here. Now uh, you can do a lot of things here. Now you can actually try to dissect this yolk here. Go inside. So you can actually try to dissect it out of its uh, wide, or you can make some. Or what you can do is, if you want to do an extra capsular dissection, give me. Uh, you can make it. Uh, you can actually uh, boil the egg, and you can remove the white. And you see here, you can. Do an extra capsular dissection. It's going to be a firm pituitary. See here. I'm now going to dissect that yolk away. That's a tumor. So imagine how much you can actually think and innovate. So everything is in your hands. People say that you know, I'm during shutdown. I don't have anything to do. Just listening to lectures or the Zoom. Why? Why should you do that? Actually, you can do all these to improve your dexterity. When you go back to your uh, surgical, now you see I've left behind only the uh, maybe the mammillary bodies. And if you have it slightly, you know, thicker, I can do an extra capsular dissection. So this is what I call the egg dissection. What you can do is now uh, come out. If you have this uh, layer here. You can take a nine zero and suture this completely. You can suture this completely, and once you suture this, you can try to invert it and see if the yolk is coming out. Uh, that means you have a water type seal. So here you can learn the dural knot. You can learn the dural knot. This can be done with microscope or with. So I use three important things. One is I use the egg, and then I use the tomato. The tomato also can be used like this. So the tomato is a friend. You can peel the uh, uh, outside of the tomato and then uh, use your dissection with the endoscope. And of course, the third is the potato. The potato. So the potato, like tumor, come on, come inside, go inside, try to go inside. So now you see here that that's extra capsular dissection, which you can actually create to dissect. So see that I can actually dissect it nicely, and you can get this. Humor in total completely. 
So that's the end of my first lecture. That was actually the uh, first part of my lecture. Dr. Harsha, did you see that completely? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Has anybody done this before? Or this is the first time? I mean, at least the, the crowd which is sitting here. Let us have the participants' opinion now. Change the camera. Oh, on it, sir. So we have, uh, one is the JR sinus model, uh, lights on please. JR sinus model you have, the second is you have the egg yolk, the tomato, the potato, all these will actually uh, increase the dexterity with which you are going to do your uh, surgery when you come back with the uh, surgery. So if the audience have any questions, I can answer it or else we can go and start our uh, uh, lecture on, of course, uh, seeing a caliber dissection is, you know, not a big deal. Many, many, many people would have seen a lot of uh, caliber dissections. That's not the great thing. This class was mainly meant because I wanted to tell you during a shutdown, how can you increase your dexterity? This is one thing. And another important thing I want to tell you, get me the camera. I will show you something which is beautiful, okay? I, I'm going to show you this. Uh, this is the camera here. See here. Of course, you should have a camera in your house. There is definitely you will have a camera. So you can say, uh, uh, okay, you have a long pen like this, okay? And then, uh, hold, hold, I guess. So these are all things you can do. Believe me, these are the things which will improve your dexterity. Uh, by just seeing or listening to some X, Y, and Z will not increase your dexterity. This is going to be, hold it. Now, uh, can you can you see the, the of course you not show the camera here with this what I will try to do is I'll be trying to write letters holding the endoscope I'll be trying to write letters here and that is something which I can do to improve my dexterity so these are all small things you can you can write with a pen or uh, you know both the hands can slow have some slow movements okay Dr. Chada have you got any doubt uh, doubts or any comments? Uh, at the end of my first part of the lecture. Come sit down here. Yeah, do you have any uh, participant can actually raise their hand and uh, you, can, you can ask some questions. So uh, I think if, you're, if you don't have resources, try to utilize the resources which you have at home. But only one thing I will tell you, to learn to swim, you have to go into the swimming pool. This is a very important fact. By seeing people swim or by seeing people doing surgery, you will never become a good surgeon. So this is the most important concept I wanted to convey to you at this moment of time where we lack the facilities to operate. But still you can keep operating because you have, you have all these uh, under you. You can use a microscope or you can use an endoscope, whatever you want but you can keep your hands still operating with just eggs or tomatoes or potatoes or you know cauliflowers or whatever but basically use keep using your hands if you don't keep using your hands your hands will get rusted so how to hold an endoscope of course you know that you hold it like a flute and of course we're going to demonstrate all that now um uh Sri harsha are you there yes sir uh, is there any question from the audience? I, I'm not able to see. Uh, or shall we go to the second part? There's one question from uh, Neeraj. How to hold the endoscope and how to insert the instrument so that they won't cross each other? Yeah, that is very important. See, the basic thing is that... Uh, no, no, no. Uh, endos give me the endoscope. So, you hold the endoscope. This is the endoscope. Hold the endoscope like this. And make sure that your instrument is always away from the endoscope, that is below. I've seen during endoscopic surgery also, what happens is that you come like this. That is the instrument comes up. And if you do that, to me, that's a wrong, wrong uh, um, step. Never go above the endoscope. Always stay below the endoscope and stay far away. If you're crossing or hitting, then you come out, see, and then go inside. So you have the leverage. In a patient, you can't do all this. But here you can see that. So that is what I want to tell you. All right. So any other questions? So I think uh, there are something which are uh, slightly uh, good for the participants. Let us go on to the video. Let us start the uh, caliber dissection video. So how do I start screen share?
steps. Yeah, yeah. How do I screen share now? Sir, there are a few questions that are coming up in the Yeah, yeah, you can ask me questions before the second session. So the first session, first part of the session is over. Because now we have actually made, uh, stimulated that all the participants' brain. I have told them there is no point in just listening or seeing people. I want you to keep your hands always mobile and always practicing surgery. And if you don't practice it for a month, believe me, when you go back, you're going to find it very difficult. Your hands will get different. So this is why I try to show this. So now I can take some questions and then we can start. So the first question that reads is, uh, what is the number of diamond per used for the egg drill? Oh, that's beautiful. Fantastic question. See, I'll tell you, if you're doing it microscopic, if you're doing microscopic, it's easier. Believe me, when you do it microscopic, the egg dissection becomes very easy. And actually, you start suturing with a 9-0. The bursts I strongly recommend are, you're drilling on the carotid. It's, this is similar like the carotid canal. Believe me, this is the same consistency as the carotid canal. And behind it will be the dura and that will be the membrane. So the best will be to use a 4-0 uh, bar. So you have a coarse diamond bar and a fine diamond bar. The best is to use a 4-0 uh, because that is the same thing you're going to use during surgery of the skull base. The surgery of the draft. Surgery during the draft or uh, draft 3 or whatever. 4-0 Diamond bar will be the best. Don't use cutting birds. Cutting birds are dangerous. It will destroy the membrane. That is point number one. Good, good question. Any other question? What endoscope systems you recommend, sir, for the beginners? Yeah, the best. See, I'll tell you. The whole, the, uh, I have seen many, many people using uh, a 70 degree in a step where it is not used. It should not be used or not needed to be used. See, uh, Professor P.J. Ormold makes the frontal... View it with a zero degree. See, the, that, is, that is actually the correct brain. So don't try to uh, show up by saying I'm using a 90 degree for the... Of course, in certain instances you have to use. But as far as possible, at least in skull base, you should not use angled telescopes. So use a zero degree telescope throughout. But if you want to get trained with a 45 or a 70, you can use a 70 and do the same drilling. You can use a 70 degree tear, but it's a very difficult uh, manual. To use a 70 and to do this drilling is really a difficult manual. Try that, but definitely uh, uh, in, during my next uh, lecture, I will ask you how many of you did the egg model uh, today or tomorrow? How many eggs did you do? How many of you could elevate the membrane? Yeah. Next. Next question. Sir, 4 mm would be fine or it would be large? That is the one question. And what, what is, is the that? size? 4 mm would be fine or it would be large? That is the first question. And one no, wait, I'll, I'll answer your first question. See, 4 mm or 3 mm are the two bars used in skull base. Okay. These are the two bars used in skull base. At least what I have been using throughout my uh, maybe 15 years or 16 years of my career or only two burrs, 3 mm burr and a 4 mm diamond burr. So this is the maximum you can use. Of course, if you want to do a mastoid surgery, you want to replicate it, of course you can use it, it could be the facial nerve canal. And you can drill with a, a 6 mm or 7 mm diamond burr. But don't use a coarse diamond because that will disrupt the membrane. You have to use a fine diamond burr. Okay? Any other question? Dr. Manuel is asking, would you explain the optic 1, 2, 3, 4? What? Dr. Manuel Santos is asking uh, if you could explain the optic 1, 2, 3, 4. Optic, uh, this, uh, optic 1, 2, 3, 4. What is optic 1, 2, 3, 4? I do not know what is optic 1, 2, 3, 4. The position of the okay, optic. Sir, we four. move to the next question. Uh, what uh, doctor is asking, uh, what you use as an anti-fogging? For anti uh, body. You mean during the surgery or uh, during the uh, uh, egg egg uh, technique? So uh, during egg technique, you can just use water. You don't need anything. But during the surgery, you use savlon. But uh, don't use savlon if you're inside the brain. So, so we generally don't use savlon. What we use is uh, we have an anti-fog solution by Carl Stores. So we use that anti-fog solution. 
don't use savlon savlon is uh, not available in some countries i have gone to some countries not found savlon i carry savlon with me the best i think is savlon of course you can use soap solution if you are doing the egg or uh, maybe uh, but the best would be um, some countries they use beta dine also i don't like beta dine the best would be water just water will be the best so water uh, is the best solution I think Dr. Uh, uh, Prakash Mukha sir has uh, posted something. I'm not able to see that, but you can convey that uh, uh, question to me. It's, uh, Dr. Mukha says that excellent example of egg practice. My yeah. compliments to your imagination, Dr. Janki. Thank you, thank you. I was just thinking on the first day itself because I was just thinking if I'm just going to see others operate, how will I, my my hands will go off? My hands will get rusted. So how do I improve my dexterity? This is what's going inside my mind again and again. So uh, at least I've done now two or three eggs now, and I'm happy that I am able to maintain my dexterity. So when I start operating, maybe in May or something like that, I will not lose my dexterity. This is something which is very very important. I am sure many surgeons what they will do is once they start doing surgery, they oh my God, um, I'm not able to even do a proper tonsillectomy. This is because your hands are not, you are totally now. Uh, on the switch off mode don't do that it's going to be very detrimental to your surgical skills so that is why i thought let me put forward this can warm water be used as anti yeah warm water at what you can use no problem to use irrigation the best i would suggest is this is the best time for you to learn four handed ask your brother sister mother or father anybody to get involved uh, at least is the time to you know ask them to get involved Ask them to hold the endoscope or fix that endoscope with a holder if you have, and then you do four-handed surgery. This is the best for you to go into the skull base. Okay. Was it raw or semi-boiled egg? Ah, uh, best is egg. you know best is use if you can do a raw egg. Just uh, at least post that on my uh, uh, my Facebook or my WhatsApp. If you can suture, see, I will tell you. i will show you one of my uh, videos where what i did was i removed that without a small hole and i made the incision and i sutured the whole membrane with a 90 and you invert that egg and the contents should not spill out if you have done that i i do it with the microscope of course i can't uh, do with that position with the endoscope if you can do that with the endoscope i think you will be the super best surgeon in the world believe me If you can suture that with a nine zero, uh, you know, ethylon or something like that, proline or whatever, this will be the best exercise you can ever practice in this world. You don't need any, uh, you know, uh, craniopharyngeal mo or a pituitary tumor uh, in front of you every day. You don't need it. Okay, right. I think we'll go on to the cadaver dissection. You stop me whenever there is questions. How do I screen share now? uh i'm going to screen share are you getting my screen now no i'll share first okay so we can see your screen now yeah yeah the turbo view is visible now yeah uh shall we start the uh, video endoscopic view is available yeah we can start okay i'm going to start the video now and uh, we will start seeing the uh, cadaver dissection First of all, I want to tell you that in endoscopic sinus surgery, uh, there are three different views you can give uh, in the nose. One, a uh, put uh, the light slightly down because uh, I'm not able to see the video well. So there are three views. One is called the superior view, that is a view from above, and second is called the middle view, and this is actually a middle view. This is a middle view. This is called the middle view. When you see an endoscopic picture, you should be able to see. Uh, tell us. what view you are giving the superior view the middle view or the inferior view middle view means the 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 endoscope is between the ala and the floor so that is called the middle view if you have a superior view the middle turbinate will appear four shortened there will be a four shortening of the middle turbinate if you actually put it as a inferior view that is when you place it towards the floor there will be something like a a, a paradoxical lengthening of the middle turbinate so if you if you actually if you see the middle turbinate like you know maybe it is slightly inferior view but definitely um, between a middle and an inferior view during surgery never give an inferior view this is something which i want to tell all our participants never give an inferior view during surgery now let us start uh, with a, a video of the cadaver dissection why is it not coming man 
Shaitra, why is it not coming? I'm trying to see it's not coming. Is it Mm -hmm. So this is again close to the video. Stop sharing. No, why is stop sharing? This one? Inside, inside. Can you see my screen, please? The screen is visible, but endoscopic camera is still. In we are unable to appreciate anatomy actually, sir. Uh, no, no, no. I, there is a problem. It's got stuck. Yeah, actually. Stop screen share has been stopped. Okay. Now? Select the video. Okay. PLC? Okay. Now I go for the of the adenoid. And la the landmark from, from rock. No, no, let the volume be there. Let us play the video. Right. Ah. Start the screen share, sir. Yeah, yeah, screen share. Screen share? Share, share. Yeah, uh, it has come, sir. Where is it? And it's the camera view, is, view has come. Yeah, yeah. You can put it this side. They can increase the size of this. Okay, can you see the endoscopic camera? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, very much, sir. We okay, start. We start with a diagnostic nasal endoscopy using a zero degree telescope. And this is the aircraft technique. The landmarks being the inferior turbinate, the middle turbinate, the superior turbinate. The sphenoid os can be seen in your picture. That's the axillary ostium which can be seen there. That's the floor. In the aircraft technique, the endoscope takes off in the anterior end of the inferior turbinate, flies between the middle and the inferior turbinate, and lands in the nasopharynx. Now we will see the landmarks in the nasopharynx, that's the East Asian tube orifice, that's the force of Rosenmuller, and the region of the adenoids. Coming backwards, that's the axilla of the middle meatus, the uncinate process, the free border of the uncinate process, the bulla et modale. And that's the hiatus seminaris inferioris. That's the axillary ostium. That's the base of the triangle where we'll have to do an ansonectomy, infundibulotomy. The first step in the procedure is lateralization of the inferior turbinate with a freeze elevator at the level of the anterior end of the middle turbinate. We never destabilize the middle turbinate at any given point during the procedure. We use a back binding forceps and engage it at the antero inferior quadrant of the bulla atmodale, corresponding to the upper two thirds and lower one third of the ancillary process. The lower portion of the ancillary process is dissected submucosally. We can see the attachment of the uncinate process to the inferior turbinate. It's a U-shaped attachment. And then we debride the mucosa of the medial aspect of the uncinate process using a micro-debrider. 
we have devised an unsnet flap and you're going to see how we do the unsnet flap we take a sickle knife and submucosally dissect the horizontal portion of the bone of the unsnet process you can see very well the bone is being dissected away care is taken not to damage the mucosa on its lateral aspect you can also see the natural ostium very clearly there the mucosa on its lateral aspect is being gently teased out and the bone being elevated this bone can go posteriorly till the palatine bone we are dissecting that bone of the lower portion of the unsnet process and once the bone is dissected out we remove that bone with the plexusly forceps the mucosa on its lateral aspect is preserved that's a plexusly force used to remove the bone now we make a horizontal incision on the superior posterior border of the natural ostium connecting it with the axillary ostium we can do this with a circle knife or a scissors and we connect the natural ostium with the axillary ostium the second step in unsnet flap is that we make a vertical incision along its anterior end so we have a rectangular flap and this is laid over the inferior turbinate the reason why we do this flap is because the whole area is not made raw and it is draped with mucosa and hence the incidence of osteal stenosis is very less and that is why we do the unsnet flap this is a 70 degree view of the maxillary sinus and we can see the interior of the maxillary sinus the intraorbital nerve and the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus now we go for the upper border of the unsnet process we use a ball probe and we tease the unsnet process and we debride away using a micro debrider it is not advisable to shear the upper border of the unsnet process because we need to see the superior attachment of the unsnet process and that will give us an idea of the drainage pathway of the frontal sinus we are now using a now i want to bring to your notice uh, how many of you can you put on the light uh, are seeing this video uh, i hope all of you are, can see the video uh, dr uh, sri harsha yes sir there are 500 participants right now okay now you see i was thinking a lot about this for the past many many years uh, i have been asking this to various people also i have still not got an answer okay now i want one of the participants at least to you know uh, uh, do this research there is many many people talk about the agonazi cell right the presence of an agonazi cell by definition a cell should have walls all around and it should have a drainage pathway correct or wrong hello sri harsha you can unmute yourself and answer just the questions which i am asking you now the agonazi cell is a cell which is been traditionally called as the anterior most ethmoid cell and we are in fact we or whenever we see the unsnet process people say when you go up this is the agonazi cell and according to professor frederick kun it is present in more than 98% of individuals but honestly speaking a 
to me is a classical agonazi cell which has got an inferior wall with at least a a a, a drainage pathway for it even a concha bullosa i find a uh, um, you know a varied drains but any of you have seen an agonazi cell with a drainage uh, uh, for it so now the question arises see this ansonet is going and getting attached to the lateral wall of the uh, uh, the, the that the, the, the lateral nasal wall that's formed by the lamina papyracea now if the so most of the definitions say the medial wall of the agonazi forms is formed by the lateral uh, by the ansonet process the medial wall of the agonazi is formed by the ansonet process so i am asking the people who have actually propagated about the agonazi what is the inferior where is the inferior wall of the agonazi which i have failed to see number 2 where is the uh, drainage pathway of this agonazi cell so to me i think when you actually present this agonazi to me is actually a misnomer in fact we are writing a paper on this i'm sure i'm going to publish this but what i mean to say such a simple thing we have been uh, talking about agonazi 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 let people come and show me uh, ostium through which the agonazi drains number 2 let people show me where the inferior wall of the agonazi is and people talk about the resistalis that is the tunnel risk that means this ansonet goes and gets attached to the lamina papyracea once it gets attached to the lamina papyracea it is always forming a blind pouch and that is called the terminal recess i agree with that completely but where is this agonazi so now in this class i uh, i evoke a serious doubt to all the participants who are seen here to tell me is does agonazi really exist or not so this is something which is there for actually for your thought but for ages we have been talking about agonazi 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 to me there is no real agonazi if you put your brain and uh, uh, think about it to me there is no real agonazi so this is 70 degree a, telescope and that's the agonazi cell see this is what i keep telling and i i have been teaching like this everybody has been teaching this i do not know why we are teaching this believe me now you can put your comments all of you can put your comments and say uh, whether what i am talking may make sense to you or not so i want i request all of you who are doing fest and please tell me how many of you have seen an ostium of the agonazi how many people have seen an inferior wall for the agonazi and just because you're seeing a terminal recess like this don't say it is the agonazi please comment now we are going medially posteriorly using a frontal ball probe and we push the agonazi that's the half egg forwards and laterally and now we are able to see in so this is exactly what professor uh, stamberger has been talking of course i respect professor stamberger a lot but my question to every rhinologist in the world is where is this drainage pathway if this is going to be the agonazi and if it is going to be a half egg uh, where why do you call it a cell so what is this agar cell so you can't call it an agar cell so to me i think it's a misnomer agar cell is a misnomer inside the frontal sinus we are now seeing the posterior table of the frontal sinus the frontal butt is seen very well the next step is to do a bullotomy the bulla has got six walls we puncture the bulla in its anterior wall yeah there is an opinion from the anterior work a mole in the my opinion when the vertical part of ansonet process joins to skull base and middle terminate the agar cell will be completed now we'll discuss about the agonazi after after this the most important discussion will be about the agonazi the drainage pathway of the frontal sinus we will do that we will discuss that well so the ansonet process can get attached of course i i also agree with it it can get attached to the lamina papyracea or it can get attached to the skull base or to the middle turbinet i have seen all the three attachments or sometimes even multiple attachments of course uh, i fully agree with all that but i do not agree with the concept of agonazi 
So this is something which I want to uh, tell this to the audience at this juncture. An inferior quadrant is punctured. We use a micro debrider and we once open the bulla, we are now able to see the basal lamella. In fact, the retrobulla recess. We are now using it. So when you when you do the bulla, I always believe that when you are doing a maxillary sinusotomy, that's a middle mare lantrostomy. Uh, um, you uh, you do also the bulla if you have disease in the bulla or polyps in the bulla. You have to go right till the skull base. Many of them they leave a little cell at the level of the uh, superior end of the bulla. Never do that. So what we did was actually an intact and bulla, bulla is technique being removed. for the frontal sinus, the intact bulla technique, and that's actually the basal lamella. You can see that now I'm trying to remove that to preserve cell. the inferior wall of the bulla. And to do an anterior skull base dissection, we remove the suprabullar cell using a frontal ball probe. And once we remove the suprabullar cell, we are now able to see the anterior ethmoidal neurovascular bundle. Now here I stop this video and show you that that's a frontal, okay? That's the anterior fovea. This is a part of the fovea, the anterior fovea, and that's the anterior ethmoidal artery. So you can, after the bullotomy, after the complete bullotomy, you all are supposed to see the anterior ethmoidal artery. So this is something which I want to insist for every person who does a skull base uh, dissection, that is the anterior skull base. You should see at the end of the bullotomy the anterior ethmoidal. There is a only two to three percent of people who have an anterior ethmoidal artery behind the basal lamella. So this is also very important, uh, always seen in front of the basal lamella. Basal lamella is the, uh, the coronal attachment of the middle terminate and the anterior ethmoidal artery lies in front of it. And the anterior ethmoidal artery lies behind the anterior uh, superior attachment of the bulla. That's why we do an intact bulla technique for the frontal recess, the, for the frontal sinus. We do an a intact bulla technique. So the anterior ethmoidal artery lies between the anterior superior attachment and the basal lamella. So whenever you do, uh, you say that I've completed a bulla uh, surgery, then you should be able to find the anterior ethmoidal artery. So this is very important. That's okay. the anterior. If you have any doubts regarding this, you can put it forward. We will answer at the end of the session. The neurovascular bundle. So that's the anterior the front artery. is seen very well. The anterior portion of the fovea anterior ethmoidal neurovascular bundle is seen very well. So this completes the bullotomy. You see, I've done a frontal, I've done an anterior foveal dissection. That's the anterior foveal dissection. I've done an anterior ethmoidal artery. A little bit of the posterior fovea is seen. So this completes a bullotomy, a frontal sinusotomy, and a middle mere lantrostomy. So if you want to complete your dissection of maxilla, or, and also the frontal and the bulla, the anterior ethmoids, then this should be the end result of that dissection. So that is all, I mean, even during surgery, you should be able to see the frontal, the anterior fovea, the anterior ethmoidal artery, a small portion of the posterior fovea, and of course the maxillary sinus. So this is what I always believe. Then you go for the basal lamella. Here, very important that you, you retain a little bit of the floor of the bulla. This is very important. Many people take off the bulla completely. Try to retain a little bit of the floor of the bulla. This is very, very important. Next step would be to puncture the basal lamella. So when you puncture the basal lamella, puncture it at the inferomedial aspect. So you puncture it at the inferomedial aspect of the basal lamella. The basal lamella, basal lamella is punctured lamella. inferiorly and medially. and then. The Bleckersley forceps is used to bluntly dissect the posterior ethmoid cells. In this cadaver, we will be actually shearing the mucosa out, but in a live situation, we would like to preserve the mucosa. We take off the mucosa here to just demonstrate the anatomy. Whenever you do the posterior ethmoid dissection, Always, always look at the floor of the basal lamella. You just have to stay close to the floor. Don't direct your instrument 
and uh, that is go posteriorly in uh, that's yet another direction. cell in the posterior moids. We are now entering that cell. So another important thing is that there are two things I want to tell you. Many people actually have a small doubt, especially the juniors. This is a cell or a skull base. So this is a cell or the skull base. So there are two ways of identifying because the commonest site of leaving behind cells is the skull base. This is a, this is a study where they say that you, you leave behind a cell towards the skull base. So how do you make sure that you have completely, uh, you know, if it is a polyp or a lot of distorted anatomy, how do you make out that you have removed all the cell? I will tell you a very easy technique. The easy technique is once you have done the frontal, if you have done an intact bulla, you have done the frontal, then just do the anterior fovea, anterior model artery, and you will follow the posterior fovea backwards. So it, it tapers downward. So you know that you see here, when you do this, it will not come like a step. It will be a smooth uh, transition from the anterior to the posterior fovea. So if you find a step like this, that means it's a cell. But a better way to do it is actually to follow the skull base from posteriorly, from the planum, and then use a blunt curette and just curate the skull base. So this is a better way than doing an anterior posterior face. So you see here what I'm trying the to do. The posterior ethmoid cells are more rectangular and larger than the anterior ethmoid cells. That is the posterior most ethmoid cell being entered. So you can see that we are removing the mucosa here. We can see here. that the skull base, the posterior skull base is tapering downwards. And now that's a 70 degree view. The now you see here, I have used only zero degree telescope all throughout, except for visualizing here in this caravan. That's the anterior ethmoid artery. This is the posterior fovea. This is the anterior fovea. This is the posterior fovea. The posterior fovea is here. This is the anterior fovea. The anterior ethmoid artery runs from posterior to anterior, obliquely. It runs obliquely. It doesn't run horizontally, it runs obliquely. It's very important. And medially, you will find that you can see the olfactory fibers. In many of the cases, you'll find the olfactory fibers coming from about all That's the anterior, anterior model neurovascular bundle, the anterior fovea. That's the close up view of the anterior ethmoid artery. That's the posterior fovea. And the posterior ethmoid artery is seen very clearly there. This is the posterior ethmoid artery, neurovascular bundle. You can see here the posterior ethmoid neurovascular bundle. Okay, now, see, you know that's a sphenoid, lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus. How will you differentiate a cell? You see here during surgery also, how will you differentiate? What the best way is you can see the color, the change in color. The change in color will clearly be visible. The posterior uh, fovea, that is the posterior part of the skull base will be pearly white. And a cell will be bluish, bluish in color. You can see that very clearly. That's the posterior ethmoid artery. You see the color, change in color. Roughly corresponds to the anterior face of the sphenoid sinus. The next step would be to open up the sphenoid sinus. So to open the sphenoid sinus, we have three different routes. You all know that's a medial route where you push the middle turbinate, push the superior turbinate and enter into the sphenoid os. Do not do that in FES because you're going to destabilize the middle turbinate. The, be, the, the, the method which Professor Stamberger has all taught us is to go through the posterior ethmoid here and go posterior inferior medial to it. And that I also don't recommend that because you're creating an axillary ostium. So the best is to create an intermediate approach to the sphenoid sinus. You see here. And for that, we follow the intermediate approach. We create a superior medial window. The landmark for creating a superior medial window would be the inferior wall of the bulla leads us on to the superior medial window. So that's why I said retain this inferior wall of the bulla. This is like the tragal marker for the facial nerve. So if you draw a line from the inferior wall of the bulla medially, to, it will point towards the superior medial window. So that is why I always say preserve the inferior wall of the bulla. Once we debride, the posterior aspect of the middle turbinate at its junction with the bulla, we have a glimpse of the superior turbinate. 
you can now have a very nice view of the superior turbinate, the indoor view of the superior turbinate there. So you don't have to resect the superior turbinate at all. Many people think you have to resect the superior turbinate. It is not required. You can just retain the superior turbinate and actually, of course, in the scalar dissection, I'm going to resect it, but you don't have to resect because there's a lot of controversy about loss of olfaction. See what I do now? That's the superior turbinate seen very clearly. And now that here's elevator. That's the intermediate approach. You see here, go between the middle turbinate and the superior turbinate and then visualize the sphenoid loss. That is the intermediate it's approach. used to gently push it laterally. The inferior third of the superior turbinate is punched out using a Carl Stowers true cutting forceps. So it's advisable not to take the whole of the superior turbinate, but just the inferior third of the superior turbinate. Of course, you don't even have to take the superior turbinate at all. You can actually uh, widen the ostia. And once this is done, this, this, this ridge of bone, which separates the sphenoid os from its lateral wall is called the Parsons ridge. This is the Parsons ridge. You have to widen the sphenoid sinus at the cost of the Parsons ridge. This is very, very important. Sphenoid os, the natural sphenoid ostium is seen very well. And we use a Stamberger's mushroom punch to widen the sphenoid os. This instrument is a very useful and delicate instrument for opening the sphenoid sinus. It prevents injury to vital structures like the optic nerve or the internal carotid artery. So how big to widen an ostium? We will discuss that when we finish this uh, dissection. These are all... Uh, going to be covered, the question is going to be up covered. You just, yeah, so this is actually a type 2 kind of. We ostium. use the sponge to take away the bone to the skull base and then a debrider is used on its lateral aspect till the orbital apex. Never use the debrider inside the sphenoid, never do that. Only on the anterior wall the debrider should be used. Never use it inside. If you use it inside, chance of damaging the carotid is very high. So the lamina papyracea. Now the sphenoid sinus is open very wide. You can see the optic nerve, the orbital apex. That's the optic nerve. That's the internal carotid artery. Very nicely seen in your picture. And that's the cellar floor. Now imagine, imagine this. Okay, I did an anterior posterior dissection like this. Imagine that what you do is you do the sphenoid first, get the planum here, that's a planum, that's a roof of the sphenoid, and then use a blunt curette, that's a 90 degree curette you have, and try to gently curate it towards the lamina papyracea. That is, don't go towards the middle turbinate or the superior turbinate. Go towards the lamina papyracea and you come forward then if you find that the anterior quadrilateral artery is not decent, you can do it very easily and you will get the whole skull base. That is the simplest way to de define the skull base. So this is what I want to insist again. That's a post model vessel. So once you're experienced, you can do the anterior posterior uh, approach that is from the frontal, go back and then get the planum. But if you're a beginner, it is always better to go from the planum and then gently use a 90 degree uh, uh, curate and then gently curate all the cells out. The skull base and the lamina papyracea. Once we go behind the middle male antrostomy, in this cadaver, we had a posterior haller cell. That's a haller cell. That's a posterior haller cell. And once okay, that is a study. That is a study which says that there are two areas, like the sinus tympani you leave behind the cholesteratoma, the same way in FES there is a study that there are two areas where you can leave behind cells. So what is that, uh, what are the two areas, that, the areas which are the commonest to leave behind cells? One is the frontal, of course, some cells near the frontal can be left behind. 
the second uh, uh, is uh, uh, that is near the frontal and the skull base and the second very important thing is behind the maxilla behind the maxilla and the sphenoid sinus if you draw a line there some people leave behind a lot of see for example this other cell could be actually missed so the two important areas you should always remember to clear the cells like in sinus tympanic cholesteatoma the same thing is here applying in face also clear the area between the the posterior fontanel that is between between the maxillary sinus and the sphenoid so you sinus. see a hollow cell we are supposed to connect it with the middle meal antrostomy hollow cells can be anterior middle or posteriorly placed they reduce the size of the maxillary os now we trim off all the bony spicules and at the end of the procedure we should have a smooth looking cavity without any bony spicules hanging down that's the final result we'll have to achieve after a total sphenoid mastectomy that's a skull base that's supposed to be a skull base that's anterior portal arch so what is the most delicate part of this once you have finished it of course if your if your anatomy is distorted where you will be very careful this area is where you should be very very careful that is the anterior portal artery entering into the skull base that's the orbital part this is the uh, skull base part you see how bluish it is it looks like a cell here the same uh, in a live live individual also because the skull base is 0.05 mm in thickness and this where when you put your instrument medially and upward so it's the entry of the small artery towards the uh, skull base it is easy to create a csf leak so that's the common side i have i've seen three for the hydrogenic csf leaks the, that's the, a remnant superior turbinate the middle turbinate very stable in your picture the next is okay so this is the end of the uh, fess uh, dissection that is anterior posterior ethmoidectomy of course we will take questions now i'm going to stop share and i'm going to take questions uh, now yeah now are we ready uh, because the cadaver dissection is over now yeah here now dr uh, sri harsha you are there yes sir i am here sir yeah you can uh, read the questions or i can take the questions from the um, the the participants yes sir uh, dr shagun shrestha pre operative and pre operative preparation for fest okay yeah that that we are going to discuss tomorrow tomorrow we are going to um, talk about pre operative preparation for uh, so we have a series of lectures uh, tomorrow is going to be pre op preparation and then intra op uh, in a polyposis and then post op so that we are going to discuss tomorrow any other question exercise and precautions to prevent managing damage to the carotid during sphenoid how do you prevent uh, the carotid during sphenoid how do you prevent injury to the carotid okay number one is that whenever you you always identify the natural ostium or the sphenoid sinus point number 1 point number 2 is do not enter into the sphenoid blindly even a suction tip if you enter blindly it is a dangerous thing number 3 is never use a debrider inside the sphenoid sinus number 4 or before all this you have to read the cd scan the coronal cut to the cd scan to see if The, usually the clinoidal part of the carotid is the uh, the more dehiscent part of the carotid the other parts are not uh, you know dehiscent it's around 8 to 16% dehiscent of the carotid artery the thing is you should read it preoperatively and never use any instrument blindly inside the sphenoid sinus this is the most important lesson which you should do when you do fest you can use a debrider but with control on the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus never go inside blindly inside the sphenoid sinus okay one more question from dr aditya what yeah. are the advices and precautions to be used while we just begin to start using a micro debrider yeah number one is see the micro debrider is uh, uh, actually a beautiful instrument it's a beautiful instrument 
Uh, to me, doing a fest without a deep rider is like doing a mastoid without a drill. This is what I equated to. So you should be conversant using the deep rider, number one. Number two is, I have seen in, even now, I see some video, I saw some uh, videos on the other day, people are using a rat 40 deep rider blade for a bulla. I was actually laughing at that because please do not use angled blades unnecessarily because these are uh, blades because I always say when you use a straight instrument, of course, if you are very, uh, very uh, experienced, you can do, use whatever you want. But when you're posting that video for demonstration, people will observe you. So this is very important. Use always straight instruments because the pressure which you have here will be the same pressure here. But the angled instrument, you don't know what pressure the tip of the instrument is going to generate. The tactile feedback to the brain is different when you use angled debrader blades. Use straight debrader blades, number, number two. Number three is that when you use a debrider, please understand that the faster the debrider rotates, the lesser will be the tissue it will be sucking out. If, the, if you are uh, rotating the debrider slower, the more tissue will be sucked. This is very important. It's actually the opposite to uh, a drill. So this is very important. Number four is that do not face the debrider blade towards vital areas. For example, if you are using it on the lamina paparasia, you have to use the guard, guard towards the lamina paparasia. So if you are using it on the skull base, be very careful when you're using the guard towards the skull base. Use the guard towards the skull base. So don't, I mean, if you're experienced, you can do whatever you want, but it is always better in your initial period when you're learning with the debrider, don't use the cutting edge of the debrider towards vital areas. This is what I want to tell you. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, what is the inferior limit of the What is what? Inferior limit of widening of the sphenoid sinus. Oh, that's a very good question. See, I'll tell you. Previously, when when I used to you know demonstrate, or even uh, when many people used to demonstrate, they have written textbooks also. They always say widen the sphenoid inferiorly. That is the safest. Nowadays, we don't do that. We now know after the advent of skull base that there is a artery which is the posterior central branch or the sphenopalatine artery which is running inferiorly. If you want to widen the sphenoid inferiorly, what you have to do is to make a gentle incision there, elevate the mucosa, then you widen it with a, a, a mushroom punch. Do not damage the mucosa inferiorly. So inferior widening, I do not agree. The best widening is lateral, anterolateral widening, not superior. Superior you'll have around, around five millimeters. But anterolateral widening at the cost of the Parsons ridge, but in sinusitis that can be really thick, that bone can be really thick. You have to widen it by gently opening that black sleeve. Introduce the black sleeve into the uh, ostium and open that black sleeve. Reverse, that's not the plucking way, the reverse way, then you will break the uh, Parsons ridge and then you can use a sphenoid punch and widen it at the cost of the anterolateral wall. Don't widen it at the inferior wall because it will produce a lot of bleeding okay and if you need a hard art flap then it's going to be difficult yeah sir, there are few questions uh, regarding frontal sinus I'll yes out, sir. One yeah is how to detect the frontal with 70 degree endoscope yeah is that question and the uh, other question is how to differentiate the agar cell opening and frontal recess for sure uh, yeah and tips to enter frontal sinus safely and uh, 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 yes, yeah, I, I, will, I will now show you the video. Hey, where is the video now? Can you show me the video? See, I asked one question uh, about how many people agree that there is an agonazi cell. So, this is uh, I asked you, but I think nobody has commented about that. Okay, let us now see this frontal sinus dissection. Can you see the screen sharing now? Not yet, Dr. Pushta. Not yet, sir. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet, sir. Okay, share. Now, can you see it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Endoscopic view has come. Okay, now what I'm going to do is to show you how to easily access the frontal. Okay, easy access to the frontal. So now I've done the maxilla. That's a 70 degree view. The first step in frontal sinus dissection should be first you elevate this 
unselect process with a ball probe. Gently elevated with a ball probe like this. You just medialize that ball, uh, unselect process. Now, after that, you try to debride this part of the unselect process. Some people use a 90 degree uh, Blakesley forceps. Uh, you can use it. Uh, uh, what you have to do is to gently debride this and then come to its upper limit. Okay. Once you come to its upper limit, if you are doing an, in, so from here you can take an intact bulla technique or you can do, do a bulla down technique. So if you are doing an intact bulla, why do you want to do an intact bulla? Because you are going to prevent injury to the anterior model artery. So that's why you are doing an intact bulla technique. So now you use a 70 degree telescope or you can do an axillary flap. If you do, if you are not very conversant in using a, a 70 degree, best thing is to take an axillary flap. That is take a flap here and then punch off this bone, then you can use a 30 degree or a 45 degree. But without doing an axillary flap, doing it with a 30 and a 45 is really difficult. So if you are not conversant in using a 70 degree, try to do an axillary flap technique as, as described by Professor P.J. Ormold. So that is the best way. Now the second is, the question is, whether the, there is agonazi or not. That itself is a big controversy. I do not agree that there is an agonazi. But whatever you see above, just follow this unsnet process. See this unsnet. You are left behind a little. What is this? Somebody has uh, put a. Someone else has done work from Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, we would we would request participants not to use annotation uh, uh, model. But that, do not that appear on all the screens. I don't know why it's appearing on the screens. Now don't don't please don't put that yellow uh, mark and things like that. Annotation. Don't use annotations. Now you can see the upper part of the uh, unsenate process. You see here, always in live, see the upper part of the unsenate process. This is very important. You can then decide, of course, in preoperatively, you'll see it. From here, preoperatively, then intraoperatively, you see it. If you turn towards the unsenate, the middle turbinate, this is the simplest frontal you will have. Tomorrow, we are going to show you so many videos on the frontal sinus dissection. But if the Unsnet is towards the middle turbinate, it is the lateral drainage and it is very simple to open the frontal. It will already be open. So that is second. Then third, if it is going to be towards the uh, lamina papyracea, forming, forming the recess terminalis, gently push your ball probe. Use your ball probe and go just behind. You see what I am doing? Just see this very, very carefully. Now we are going this. medially, posteriorly. Now you see here, I am going now. Posterior to this so-called or whatever is called the agonazi and you're already inside the front. The, the problem comes when there is a cell, maybe a type 3 cell. So this you should already preoperatively see whether the patient has got uh, a posterior group of cell or an anterior group of cell. You know that there are uh, uh, anterior group of cells, you have type 1, type 2, uh, type 3 cell and uh, of course there is no type 4 cell. There is a uh, that's a misnomer, but you have an um, uh, anterior group of cell is uh, uh, type 1, 2, 3, and 4. Of course, you have posterior group of cells. Now, if you find a posterior, what are the posterior group of cells? Number one is supra second is frontal bulla, and third is supraorbital. Of course, uh, a PJ's classification, supraorbital has been deleted. Now, to me, I think there's a supraorbital cell. Uh, we have seen that. So you can see three kinds of cells. If you find that in the preoperative scan in a sagittal view, do not do a intact bulla technique. At least in the initial part of your career, don't do an intact bulla technique because a posterior group of cell can actually, uh, uh, you know, make your life difficult if you are trying to do an intact bulla technique in a posterior group of cell. If you have an anterior group of cell, try to do an intact bulla technique. If there's a posterior group of cell, do not try to do an intact bulla technique. This is very, very important. Next question. So, what is the easiest way? Okay, uh, I can't study the cells. I don't want to, uh, you know, see what kind of cell is there. But I want to open the frontal sinus. There are some people who want to open the frontal sinus. Number one, iatrogenic frontal sinusitis is the commonest cause for frontal disease. Please understand that. If you want to open the frontal sinus, you have to open it completely. So tomorrow I'm going to show you what are the boundaries of the frontal recess. All that I'll be showing to you tomorrow. But never put in a suction and try to just push it inside into the frontal and say that you opened the frontal sinus. This is bad. Okay. But to initially open the frontal sinus, 
you want to feel the front sinus you don't know what cell is there i will tell you a small trick what is the trick hey give me the frontal ball pro so this is the magic instrument i call this the magic instrument for the uh, of frontal sinus so you see here you're going to use this frontal ball pro this is a kun seeker and you're going to direct it towards this is the lamina papyracea and this is the uh, uh, the nasofrontal beak you hug the nasofrontal beak and the lamina papyracea so here you see here the lamina papyracea is here and this is the nasofrontal beak don't tilt it too much it should be in the uh, uh, sagittal plane and then gently go up gently go up between the this is the nasofrontal beak hug the nasofrontal beak hug the lamina papyracea i have seen that some people move it like this and go inside the orbit but one thing you will never do in this technique is you will not puncture the skull base so this is never it will never happen so you just hug the uh, nasofrontal beak and stay sagittal and gently go inside the front sinus this is the only way you can be sure that you are opening the front sinus without seeing the front sinus but i strongly recommend that you see before you do this this is what i advise any other question so i think we have come to the end of the session uh, i think it's already uh, 7:30 and uh, we will discuss a lot of techniques of dissection of various uh, uh, videos tomorrow we will uh, we will show you uh, sinusitis video we will show you polyposis uh, uh, ethmoidal polyp anthropoidal polyp that is for tomorrow so today we had some new concepts think about it in your house about the agonazi think about the uh, uh, the egg the egg model think about the tomato model to think about the potato model and come back to me tomorrow same time at 6 o'clock see you all bye bye and have a good night thank you thank you so very much dr janke for this spectacular uh, program uh, and attendance is such we have exhausted our zoom capacity oh, what is your viewing capacity what is your viewing capacity was 500 and today we have applied for 1000 immediately oh. okay 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 you so won't believe not, yeah you won't you won't believe within 2 minutes of starting session yeah. the capacity was exhausted and there were 200 doctors in waiting area i had to say sorry to many doctors what we oh. are doing is the recorded version we will be put on your uh, facebook page or you know uh, some link so that yeah. whatever they have missed out today they yeah. recapitulate and tomorrow yeah. we will come full flock with you know 1000 capacity yeah whether you have at least 1000 to 1500 because yeah. i'm sure that you will have definitely 1500 viewers definitely <laughs> because from tomorrow you going to have more of uh, you know videos lot of yeah. good videos and tactical uh, simple methods to open up so yes. this uh, many rhinologists want to uh, uh, learn uh, the easy technique to uh, open up a lot of sinuses and definitely you will have a lot of crowd dr chata very very nicely done uh, professionally done uh, alambic and uh, i really thank alambic i thank all the viewers in case you want to uh, you know discuss with me you can come one to one now you can unmute if uh, there are at least uh, some people they can talk with me if they want and uh, allow some uh, some people to uh, raise your hand if you uh, want to talk and you can put them on uh, talking mode with me thank you very much sir thank you very much some sir. very senior very doctors sir. are also participating sir dr oh, yeah, from yeah. kolkata yeah. mm, uh, dr mm, shabir haldar sir many oh, senior doctors shabir are shabir haldar is yeah, my yeah. close friend very close friend yeah yeah dr yeah, if Chabir, you have anybody who wants to Oh, uh, talk with me one to one. Uh, that is about uh, through the Zoom. Please uh, put them. Uh, uh, I'm I'm seeing Dr. Prakash Munka Ji, my brother. He's also there from Bokaro. Almost hundred overseas doctors are also on the board, sir. Wow, that's very good. Count. Yeah. So, so now, uh, doctors, uh, delegates can unmute themselves if they want to talk to Dr. Jankiram directly. No, no. So, but the thing is, uh, once everybody unmutes, it should not be a confusion. So I agree, sir. So ask them to uh, uh, raise their hand, and they can actually unmute. You will unmute them. You will unmute them. Run through. Doctor H H Ravi Kishore has raised hand. Yeah, please. Munka has raised hand. 
Yeah. Dr. Munka is here. Yeah, you, you can give them. So I am. Uh, Sir, it's pleasure as to, usual to watch yeah. the the basics first, and then you go built up. So we gradually. and that is beneficial to all the beginners as well as the expert and sometimes i always keep on poking you don't have this instrument what you substitute and we always discuss that sort of thing so uh, the so the suggestion which earlier we have about the endoscope should always visualize the instruments and nothing should be done without visualization so that's all thank you very much it's an and your imagination was you know unique for egg to tomato and potato uh, one can try that thank you very much sir you are on mute dr janki you are on mute unmute yourself unmute Char charlie mute unmute sir i have unmuted uh, yes, sir yeah 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 now you are audible yes, yes now sir. actually uh, dr muka ji we are seeing a lot of zoom and we are seeing actually the good videos done by a lot of uh, good people i agree but the thing is Well, I have seen my own uh, residents. After one month, when they, when they come and start operating, they will find, oh my God, my hands are fixed. I'm not able to operate properly. So I honestly believe that the seeing a surgery doesn't translate into doing a surgery. It is very important. That's why I was thinking during the shutdown, how am I going to tell this to the audience? And Alan Bika has given me a very good platform where I have told them, very. You see here. You see here. you see this is the you will definitely have this in your house i am sure everybody will have this uh, in your house uh, how many don't have you please tell me so <laughs> if you don't if you don't have this i'm sorry you should be a pure vegetarian but i think i, I take at least 6 uh, to 10 eggs every day so best thing is this is actually not the uh, broccoli egg see there's something about it this is the we be called that not to mutai this is a natural egg yellow in color you see This is a, not the normal egg. The normal egg is whitish in color. That is more thick. This is more thicker. See, I didn't tell this actually. This is a very important point. So don't take the white egg. Take that uh, what we call the natto curry. What is that called in English? So I am not sure. This is slightly more expensive than the white egg, uh, and uh, that is better for dissection. So get this uh, if you don't have. Tomorrow go to some stores. Get this. Take some four eggs. Boiler egg, illa. Not the boiler egg. The, and another thing is, you can do the same exercise in the boiled egg, and also in the tomato. Tomato, if you can do, your your simply super. Yeah. In slang language, we call it that desi egg, desi anda. Ah, uh, but uh, the foreigners will not understand. No, the there are so many foreigners here. I can see a lot of uh, foreign faces. So desi egg. So yeah, no, the Indians. I'll unmute now, Doctor H. Ravi Kishore, yeah, who sure. uh, has raised hand. Yeah, Dr. Ravi Kishore. Now you can speak. You are on unmute mode. Yeah, Dr. Ravi Kishore. Hello. I think we'll go to uh, Dr. Debangshu Ghosh. Yeah, please. Dr. Dr. Debangshu. Dr. Debangshu, you can speak. Hello, hello, sir. Hi, Dr. Debangshu. Hello. How are you? Hello, hello, hello. I am fine, sir. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. I'm from Calcutta, sir. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for your excellent demonstration. And the model code is very curious and very interesting to practice in yeah. my home. Well, yeah. while we are at home now, one thing I want to clarify: what I find difficulty yes. is to find the frontal sinus. And the yes. comparison of the technique of actually flap technique versus intact bulla. What is yes. what and what the advantages and the pros and cons of this? What is the beneficial for us, like juniors? See, if you are going to be a junior, a starter, the easiest way to do a frontal is the axillary flap. Okay, this is very clear. If you are starting yeah. with doing a frontal sinus, the first fifty cases you want to do a frontal. The easiest way is from the PJ or Mons axillary flap. There is no doubt about it because yeah. the seventy degree view is converted into a thirty degree view or a forty five degree view. So if you, I will show you tomorrow the axillary flap technique, how to do the axillary flap. Uh, all that I will show you tomorrow. The easiest will be the axillary flap. Second is the easiest will be the intact bulla technique because you are not going to injure the anterior model artery. So you are keeping the bulla intact. You are doing an axillary flap. You are going to remove the anterior wall 
of the so called agonazi i don't believe in that so you call, you uh, take that the nasofrontal actually the ascending process of maxilla is what you take so you take that out and you will have a direct view of the uh, upper part of the uncinate remove that you will be inside the fort so this is the easiest way to tackle the fort but if you are having a posterior group of cell this doesn't work because the anterior wall of the posterior group of cell actually comes anterior so what you have to do is in that instance you go to the sphenoid take off all that uh, cells along the skull base identify the anterior model artery so something like in the thyroid you identify the recurrent lenticella and then you go for the dissection same way identify the anterior model artery identify the anterior fovea then go for the frontal last if you have a posterior group of cell which can be seen only in a sagittal cut or if you are able to see in the coronal cut it's great yeah yeah thank you thank you very much thank you thank you very much thanks and uh, be safe at home yeah any other person wants to talk uh, any doctor wants to chat i am free so uh, i think i think most of you have got this book uh, i am sure you have got this book uh, that has been written by us uh, this has been co-authored by professor sethi uh, omkar deshmukh and arvind gananathan and you can read this book uh, we have authored it and in fact alambic has given this uh, copy free uh, to all the doctors in india and this gives you a beautiful cadaver demonstration here so you can read this book if you want just just to inform you yeah so it's available on amazon you can order but i don't know whether it's available now any other doctor dr chadda ms chadda yeah uh, charlie uh, dr shailaja kandi want to talk to sir shailaja yeah dr shailaja please hello sir good evening sir it good was very really nice meeting you sir Thank um you. i'm very happy to watch this video but unfortunately i couldn't uh, um, uh, understand the egg model tomato and potato model uh, uh -huh. regarding <laughs> regarding what <laughs> because i i was joined very late i'm so sorry no no this this will be available madam on uh, uh, mrs chatta is going to put it on the youtube and also on facebook uh, live mrs chatta you can answer uh, the whole yeah, yeah, video yeah, is there yeah 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 for sure we will share some link with you or we will po post this on uh, janki sir's you know facebook timeline and the video will be made available to you by tonight only the okay, entire sir. program is being recorded we will preserve and uh, upload okay. this program right? dr shailaja dr shailaja yes sir yes one sir thing sir tell me dr shailaja you are young or old or what is your uh, age i mean uh, not i'm age. Uh, i'm oh, 34 34 your, uh, sir senior person starting with no no you are starting with pet or you are already uh, uh, um, an experienced pet surgeon no sir i am just a, a junior consultant okay. you are a junior doctor dr shailaja the best thing i tell you spend at least 1 hour every day on the egg model okay This sir sure like like a very important uh, advice i am giving to all of you don't make your hands rigid because this is the yes. time because hereafter i don't know when we are going to start electro surgeries we don't know yes sir so yes, this sir. time when you remind with your hands fixed then that's it that's the end of your surgical career so the best way is to dissect the egg model that's why i brought this egg model and demonstrated so the whole world i i request that you keep your hands always enough of uh, every day at least two zoom meetings you see after that practice practice on your egg model you can do head and neck dissection also in this you can do whatever you keep your microscope you have to have a lens just a lens the 2x lens and keep doing it so you see the video and you will know what i talked about okay sir thank you sir Shall sure take, i will definitely dr sudipta tarun sen ah uh, hi dr sudipta he is from uh, uh, calcutta right sudipta tarun sen uh, charlie unmute him hello hi dr sudipta one of yours i'm very much impressed whenever i see you operating or even see uh, operating on video sir so i have a Thank question sir when i'm operating on the sphenoid area sir and it's very edematous so i find it at uh, times very i'm uh, very scared to go ahead because the landmarks become very uh, confusing so okay. what is your technique okay the best easiest technique i will tell you this is a very common finding which many people say not only you many people especially when there is a multiple polyposis or there is a revision case you are not able to find the sphenoids 
Correct? Exactly. So, the best way, the best and easiest way, they get me the uh, flexible ball code or straight ball code. You have to get this instrument after the lockdown. Ma, peanut ball code. And the yellow, yellow ball code. I will show you the instrument. Please buy this instrument. This is available with uh, all the Indian surgical companies. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, this is the instrument you see here. This is again a magic instrument for me for the sphenoid sinus. You see, this instrument has got a. Uh, can you see here the tip here? Hello, Dr. Sudipta. Yeah, I can hear. I can see it, sir. Can you see the you ball? A ball tip, and then you see it's a very flexible instrument. It does, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not rigid. So what okay. you can do is this is the best instrument for the sinus sinus. So you make it straight, and then you go see here. You take the landmarks, the following landmarks. You just you created an intermediate window. That's a superior medial window. You hug the septum. You hug the septum, and then stay parallel to the. Uh, basal lamella. So this is the basal lamella here, the uh, bulla, uh, the basal lamella. This is the superior tablet. Between the superior tablet and uh, and the uh, septum, you just have to use a blunt ball probe, a straight ball probe, and just slightly, very. See, you hold only with the two hands. Don't hold very tight. Gently, you just keep palpating like this. Above, 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 above. It'll move inside. It'll just drop like a baby inside. Then you know that's the sphenodos. So this will not damage the carotid. This will not damage anything. You keep this like that itself. You keep keep this probe inside like that itself. Then you use a blackest leaf and gently separate it, and you can widen that os. That is the easiest way to open the sphenodos. Okay, so thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you. So I think Dr. Chadha, uh, Mr. Chadha, I think we'll uh, call it a day. I think we have done yeah. a lot of uh, work yes. at 8 o'clock. So thank, thank you, you very you. much. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank so you. We'll keep this excitement on and we'll meet tomorrow on Zoom, sir. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you.